Tiempo. Pass. It's not very nice. The last video ended in the rain up in Rogers Pass. We had to leave the Columbia River near the submerged village of Beavermouth, where it becomes Kinbasket Lake, as there are no roads around the north end, the Big Bend as they call it. Rogers Pass is the lowest route between Sir Donald and Hermit Ranges of the Selkirk Mountains. Building Canada's transcontinental railway took four years from 1881 to 1886. By the end of 1883, the railway had reached the Rocky Mountains just eight kilometers east of the Rockies. While the rail advanced across the prairies, the railway sought a way over the unexplored Selkirk Mountains. Major A.B. Rogers was given the task and discovered the large level opening between the mountains where the waters flowed east and west, which now bears his name. On November 7, 1885, the last spike was driven at Kregeliki, a little ways west of Revelstoke. Getting trains over the Rogers Pass was challenging. Pusher locomotives had to be assigned, and trains over 1,016 tons had to be cut. On March 4, 1910, the Rogers Pass avalanche killed 58 men clearing the railway. It is Canada's worst avalanche disaster. Over 200 people had been killed by avalanches in Rogers Pass since the line opened. In 1913, the CPR began boring the five-mile-long Connaught Tunnel through Mount MacDonald. It opened on December 13, 1916, and the railway abandoned the pass. In 1984, construction of a nearly 15-kilometer-long Mount MacDonald Tunnel began. It opened in 1988 and handles most westbound traffic, while the Connaught Tunnel handles mostly eastbound traffic. Back to the Columbia River, Mica Dam creates Kimbasket Lake, which covers 427 square kilometers and stretches more than 183 kilometers northwest, almost reaching Valmont. Mica Dam was built as one of three Canadian projects under the terms of the 1964 Columbia River Treaty. Completed in 1973, the Mica Dam is the tallest dam in Canada and one of the largest earth-filled dams in the world, with a height of 244 meters. Water from the dam flows directly into Revelstoke Lake, created by the Revelstoke Dam. Mica and Revelstoke Dams are two of the three dams on the Canadian side that were mandated by the Columbia River Treaty. The 1961 agreement between Canada and the United States was about the development and operation of dams in the upper Columbia River Basin for power and flood control to benefit both countries. The other Canadian dam is Keenly Side, down by Castlegar. We'll come back to the treaty in a bit. Quite the drop. The Columbia. Amazing! I couldn't find any reasonable accommodation in Revelstoke, so... And it's, the weather's terrible up there, so... I'm heading south on Highway 23 beside the uh, Upper Arrow Lake, although I haven't seen it yet. Um, and it's looking a little better, but it's still raining. This is called Blunkett Creek Provincial Park. I don't normally do provincial parks, but... It's getting late. The 1948 Columbia River flood caused extensive damage from Trail BC to near Astoria, Oregon, and completely destroyed Vanport, the second largest city in Oregon. These new dams would control flooding all along the Columbia, and the U.S. would pay Canada a one-time payment as each dam was completed for half the value of the estimated future flood damages prevented in the U.S. They would also generate huge amounts of hydroelectricity, which was more than BC needed at the time, but the U.S. would buy the excess and help finance the construction costs. With the cash from the treaty, approximately $274.8 million in September 1964, the BC government was able to develop power facilities on both the Columbia and Peace Rivers. The treaty has generated huge benefits for both countries. However, it was a product of its time. There was little consideration of the impacts on the, on the massive salmon runs on the river, on the First Nations who had lived on its bank for millennia, nor the environment in general. 
An agreement in principle was signed by the two countries in July of 2024, agreeing to the approach to modernize the treaty. And sorry, Donald, it doesn't contain any provisions for supplying water to California. Originally two lakes 14 miles apart, the Arrow Lakes became one 230 kilometer long lake when the Keenly Side Dam was completed in 2002. At low water, the two lakes remain distinct, connected by a fast moving section known as the Narrows. Damming the lower Arrow Lake resulted in water rising 12 meters above natural levels. As a result of higher water, the valley lost two thirds of its arable land, and approximately 2,000 people were relocated. There are three ferries that cross the Arrow Lakes. So this Arrow Lake ferry out of Shelter Bay is free and it runs uh, on the hour. These rails here are so that they can move the boarding ramp up and down depending on the water level. And she is pretty low. The era of paddle wheelers on the Arrow Lakes and adjoining reaches of the Columbia River is long gone, but an important part of the history of this region. Paddle wheelers were employed on both sides of the border in the upper reaches of the Columbia, linking port towns on either side of the border. In the early days of the Kootenays, two railroads ran east-west the CPR at Revelstoke, and the Northern Pacific just south of the American border. The paddle wheelers provided north-south connections to those railroads, allowing mined resources a way out and manufactured goods a way in. There is a beautiful example of a lake paddle steamer in Caslow, the Moyi, which ran on Kootenay Lake from 1898 to 1957. This is in the cusp. Nacusp started with a post office, general store, and sawmill in 1892, but building lots were not for sale in the town site until the following year. A school came in 1895, a church in 1898, and electric power arrived in 1920. The reservoir for the Keenly Side Dam submerged the former waterfront area in 1968 necessitating some reconstruction. Nacusp has a population of 1,589 and hosts two motorcycle rallies each year. A Haas and Jill's Bistro is a win. And a crispy chicken burger was amazing. And I have a hotel booked. And so far, it is not raining, but it's looking a little ominous to the south. Leaving Arrow Lakes slash Columbia River, you can go a little farther south from here down to a place called Farquhar and the Needles Ferry, which goes over towards Vernon. But uh, this is the easiest way to get down towards Castlegar. The discovery of silver in this Slocan range in 1891 created a mining boom. From 1895, the Nacusp and Slocan Railway brought ore northwestward to Nacusp from the inland mines. This is New Denver, which sits on Slocan Lake, which is the lake I've been riding beside for the last...
Got some stuff burning over on the other side. The rail line initially connected Nakasp and Three Forks and was expanded to Sandon. The competing Caslow and Slocan Railway connected Caslow and Sandon. From 1897, the Columbia and Kootenai Railway, that trail I camped on last video, helped divert US bound traffic from the foot of the lake to the Nakusp landing. Slocan is a very funky little village. I kind of like it. There's a little gas station here, a tiny little general store. This is the Slocan Nakusp Rail Trail. <laughs> And on that side too. And this goes a long way. I could take it for a little bit just to try it out. Cool! No motor vehicles. Okay, that was short and sweet. This Slocan Valley is really quite pretty and really nice driving. Stunning mountains on either side. This is the Slocan River again. And it ends here where it runs into the Kootenai River. The Kootenai River is pretty big. Old bridge down there. So there is the Kootenai River running into the Columbia. Down there. So this is Tech Kaminko's big lead smelter and trail. Trail was named after the Dudney Trail, which passed through this area. Employing approximately 1,800 people, Tech Resources, formerly Kaminko, is the region's largest employer and home to one of the largest lead and zinc smelters in the world. The smelter has been in operation for over a hundred years and has provided many well-paying jobs that do not require more than a high school education. I love the way the smelter kind of looms over the town. By the end of World War I, the smoke pollution had devastated the surrounding district. During the following decades, this triggered the trail smelter dispute. This case is a landmark in environmental law, helping to establish the polluter pays principle for transnational pollution issues. Kaminko built a 1,200 pound per month electrolytic heavy water plant from 1943 to 1956 as its contribution to the Manhattan Project's attempt to build the world's first atomic bomb. 